Leggiamo una poesia breve mentre salutiamo Mattias Poterci e anche, salutiamo anche Gordon Stewart, salutiamo il maestro Fausto Tapergi. Leggiamo una poesia di Enzo Nasso. Isola. Mi fisso alle lampare. La mia isola è oltre, ove si perde in infinito lo sciacquio del mare. Così. Basta. Tre versi. Poi ce n'è un'altra pure sempre di tre versi. Umore. Il paesaggio si allargò la sera, sopraggiunta distrusse ogni frontiera. Allora una città nacque d'incanto. Salutiamo Shendali, poeta cinese. Appunto, non so se risultò dalla mia pena presa nel gioco dell'aria sonnata, la città diventava una borgata in preda a un'umanità serena. Ponte, gli angeli sono inutilmente d'oro sopra i ponti di pietra come altari sconsacrati. Resisteranno ancora, in quale gloria, al chiaro della luna? Gli angeli sono inutilmente d'oro, ma la notte distrugge anche le statue, eppure la tua immagine non dura. Mm. Queste sono antiche, molto antiche. Le carrozzette delle bambole sembravano tagliate nel marmo celeste e i palazzi erano crude formule, prismi, cubi, rettangolari. Chi è solo nella luce delle vetrine può scaldarsi le mani col fiato e cercare nell'anima colori di fuoco per accendere le sagome dei palazzi squadrati nella sera. Ma avevo tanta sete di limoni e il chiosco della piazza era un rettangolo. Io diventavo un albero di pietra. Queste erano alcune delle poesie di Enzo Nasso, poi leggeremo altre e poi lo interpelleremo intorno alla sua mostra. Allora vorrei sapere se sono pronti i nostri traduttori. E se i traduttori sono pronti... Pronti? Benissimo. E poi anche se i nostri tecnici del video sono pronti? Perfetto. 
Allora adesso noi incominciamo. Quindi sicuramente il testo di Gordon Stewart è stato passato alla, ai traduttori in copia e viene dall'Inghilterra, no? È un giovane di 80 anni, giovane ricercatore, scienziato. E gli passiamo la parola e poi dopo, dopo di lui, passeremo la parola a Fausto Tapergi per qualche notazione. Diciamo, lui non è medico, però è imprenditore, poeta, filosofo. E quindi gli passiamo la parola. Adesso intanto poi c'era anche eh, Sonia Bergami che voleva fare alcune domande, vero? Agli scienziati, eh? ad alcuni degli scienziati, in particolare a Rasnik, a Duisberg, a Kenline, no? Benissimo. Allora adesso intanto sentiamo il nostro amico... Eh? Il nostro amico Gordon Stewart. Prego. Grazie. grazie. Ah, ecco. Grazie dottore per Dilioni. Grazie. Eh. Eh, buongiorno. Buongiorno. Va bene di sì, Paolo? Sì. You can hear what I say? All right? Ok. Va bene. Well, I would like to talk in a more general way about immunity to communicable diseases, but with special reference to AIDS. And this, it will be apparent why I'm taking this approach. I've already, in some remarks yesterday, given a lead-in, and there's also an abstract, which gives some idea of what I'm going to talk about. Now, the usual view of uh, immunity is that it is a complex system of cell-mediated and biochemical and biophysical reactions which are activated by microbial infection and designed by nature to eliminate, um, to, ena to enable the body to eliminate any metazoan creature which is uh, threatening uh, health, threatening the healthy body. For, when our activation in the first place um, goes on round the clock and provides an immune safeguard against invasion, which can be re re reactivated on subsequent occasions to create an immunological memory which will resist subsequent infection. Hence, an infection will usually produce its own immunity naturally, and that immunity will not only cause recovery, but will recur and prevent reinfection. And that is a very usual situation with many well-established infections. Um, not with all of them, but with many of them. If the um, original antigenic determinant from the infecting organism as a protein, the immunochemical mechanism is very precise and can be reactivated in the same form. If it's a carbohydrate or a polysaccharide uh, antigen, then the uh, activation proceeds, but the memory is less precise. Reactivation may not produce the necessary degree of secondary immunity, hence no ability to res resist infection. This is quite apparent in the case of diseases like meningitis, where vaccination has only a very limited effect. Now, um, the reaction at that level is specifically geared uh, on a molecular basis to identify the effective antigenic and um, infective determinants. Um, but uh, in so doing, of course, it relies upon a whole battery of immunochemical substances which have been described by uh, Professor Duisberg, Dr. Rastic, and others who have spoken of, um, of complement and uh, immunoglobulins and cytokines and interleukins and all kinds of other mechanisms. There's no need for me to go into detail about that, even if I could, but um, I would say that in general terms, there's no doubt about the effectiveness of this mechanism, and indeed, the survival of all of us here and of humanity generally to all the kind of infections that we encounter um, our survival through that is proof of the efficacy, the continuous efficacy of this mechanism, historically and uh, contemporarily. Now, I'd like to look at one or two 
traditional depictions in this regard. Could we switch on the um, slide, please? Diapositivo Uno. Now this, I think, will be familiar to all of you as a typical epidemic curve of a well-known infection. And there's no doubt here about what is the cause of this infection. It's a virus, it's flu, it recurs quite often, and all the time, in fact. And here is the famous Hong Kong flu episode, which occurred in New York City, where I happened to be at the time, in 1968, 69. And as you can see, um, you arrive at I don't have a pointer, do I? You arrive at um, a peak, and in a very short space of time, a few hey, weeks. Yeah. 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 In a very short space of time, within a few weeks, then this epidemic, which is the continuous line, subsides. And in fact, this is so regular that if you use a mathematical formula of a short term, epidemic, which I've shown here, then um, you can predict almost exactly the course of the epidemic. And that's the kind of thing which occurs with the typical outbreaks of acute infection. Um, now, the same might be said with, in a less dramatic way with poliomyelitis, where I'm showing here the effects in California. Thank you. Okay. Yes, that's better. I'm showing here, I hope, the effects of a similar outbreak of poliomyelitis, well-known outbreak in California and elsewhere, indeed all over the Western world, which occurred beginning about 1950 and reached a peak, um, finally, in California in, uh, in about the year 1954. And thereafter, it declined. Now, the, um, the Salk parental vaccine was introduced at that time uh, in 1955 or so. And as you can see, the decline continued. What you can say about that is that uh, there was a fall beginning at that time, which continued. And the Salk vaccine no doubt played a part in that. But then this fall was sustained right until 1962 when um, the Sabin vaccine was introduced. And uh, as you all know, uh, this was the end of poliomyelitis in most of the developed world. It has not recurred since then. But on the other hand, what can we say about this epidemic? Can we say that it was cured by vaccination, it was stopped by vaccination, and on this evidence, we can't. What we can say, yes. thank you, what we can say, yes. thank you, what we can say is that at this point, um, the epidemic was arrested and for the moment appeared to be terminated, and then the decline continued, and that was sustained. Now, that could have been because um, the epidemic was going to decline anyway and the, the intervention of the vaccine had no effect. Or it could be that the decline was going to stop and would recur then, as it did then, at that point, and it was arrested by the vaccination. Or it could be that the decline was going to continue on those lines and that vaccination interrupted it. You cannot, from that side, see what happened. All you can see is that finally, the epidemic came to an end and that uh, it continued to smolder on a small scale. Scusi, ha un microfono attaccato al collo, quindi sicuramente sta parlando vicinissimo al microfono. Yeah. Allora accendiamo anche l'altro. Can you hear Tadjo? Rush, rush, rush. 
Luna Lab. Yeah. Well, can you hear quite well? All you can see is that at that point it had been diminished in intensity and it continued on a low level until finally it stopped. Gordon. And that during that time, the oral polio vaccine, which we all know about, which we probably all received, was given and it had not recurred. So what's definite about that is, and this is all you can see, that there was an outbreak of polio and it came to an end. And during that time, um, when, it, when it had come to an end, the oral polio vaccine was given and unlike all previous history, the uh, disease did not recur. Now that's shown in the next slide, where you can see what happened in the United Kingdom. The last one related to the United States. This one relates to the United Kingdom, where you can see the death rates from polio, which are strictly age-dependent. At, at age below one, um, there was a substantial mortality. At age one to four, a bit less. Age five to 14, less still. And at age 15 or over, there was very little. But as in California, the outbreak came to an end and did not recur. Now this was clearly a function of mass immunity occurring after an acute outbreak of infection. And the mass immunity, undoubtedly the natural immunity, played a part in the prevention of recurrence, aided no doubt by the vaccine that was given at that time. Now if we look at some other common infections, whooping cough and measles in England and Wales over the period where records are quite good from 1871 until uh, about now, then what we see is that in the early part of this century, whooping cough and measles continued at a fairly high rate in terms of incidence per million population. This is a logarithmic scale. So in reality, this should be way up through the roof. Um, but a decline then started and continued through the 30s. And it was only at this final point here that immunization came in. These are whooping cough and measles. Most of the decline had occurred in mortality before vaccination was ever introduced. In other words, the natural immunity induced by those diseases and the improving conditions of the passage of time led to virtual uh, elimination of these diseases as causes of death by about the 1950s before there was widespread vaccination. And that's a very usual story in the tale of immunity. You see it here also if we look at mortality from the four main infectious diseases of childhood, measles, scarlet fever, diphtheria, and whooping cough. Starting in England and Wales again, where records back as far as 1860 from those diseases are reasonably good, you can see that there was a decline, a very marked decline in scarlet fever, uh, occurring even by the end of the century, and a slower decline in the other three in measles, diphtheria, and whooping cough, pertussa, in, uh, in all of those situations. And this would apply, you could, you could say that that similar curve would apply in Germany, in Poland, in Italy, almost everywhere. Uh, give or take a decade, it's almost the same everywhere. Um, and the result is that by about the early 60s, the mortality from uh, these diseases had, was virtually zero. And in fact, um, in England and Wales, diphtheria disappeared altogether. And uh, about that time, scarlet fever became very rare. Now this, since there were no specific vaccines against scarlet fever, and uh, since the vaccines against whooping cough uh, were very limited in efficacy at that time, then again, most of this effect occurred as a result of the combination of natural immunity occurring in the subclinical state plus the change in living conditions producing better hygiene, less overcrowding in houses and schools and so on. So this is a change which is partly natural immunity from exposure to infection recovery and partly uh, the, pa the passage of time with improvement in living conditions. A very 
constant feature in infectious diseases. Now, it's possible to understand this not only in terms of biology and even common sense, but also to work it out mathematically. Because, by definition, any population at risk of infection, N, is made up of the total of the number of individuals in that population who are susceptible, the number of individuals, that's S, the number of individuals in that population who are infective and infectious, who can pass on the infection, the number of people in that population who then get the infection, Z, and either recover or die. And that is the, that is the global population for this particular equation. Now, it's then it's a, a very simple exercise in differential calculus to see that the number of new infections over a short period will be the difference in the number of susceptibles over a given period of time. And that this will be a function of uh, beta, or kappa, which, have, which is the contact rate between susceptibles and effectives. Um, and of course, that would be a negative quantity because it would be a drop in the number of susceptibles. Then the changes in the number of infective persons will be worked out similarly by the differential between the number of infectives over a period of time uh, and the, the total rate minus the change caused by removal, gamma, of infectious persons. And then you can arrive at further measure of that change and that this useful equation uh, here, which gives the relative removal rate of infectious persons. And obviously, an epidemic will not start unless this quantity is less than the original number of susceptibles. And that will determine what we call the epidemic threshold. At that level, the epidemic threshold will operate and determine whether or not there's going to be, uh, as in flu, a total subsidence of the infection or a recurrence. And this will depend to some extent upon the number of new infectives entering the population, for example, new births, new babies, or upon the rate at which infected persons are removed, either by death or recovery. Now, on that basis, if we look at the global picture, then you see that in terms of these main infections, measles, malaria, influenza, and the dysenteries, which were global killers in the earlier part of the century, that by 1967, according to the uh, studies of the health of mankind and the various WHO bulletins, um, those main infections, measles, malaria, influenza, and all the disciplines had come down to being a very small proportion of the total, although the pneumonias, gastroenteritis, tuberculosis, remained as major threats, as major continuing threats in terms of the virulence of, of communicable diseases. There were, of course, other things coming in to fill the gaps, like cancers and stroke, heart disease in aging populations. But those major communicable diseases were declining by 1970. Now, it's possible to understand this and put it all together in the form of a, a flowchart, um, where we start with our infective subject as in the equation I. I for infectious. And that can come from an infective person or it can come from non-human sources, uh, like, for example, anthrax bacilli, carcass that have imported cattle or something like that, um, or some, something in the water supply, salmonella type. It can, so it can come even from a, the, uh, a person who is ill or a carrier or a non-human source. That is the germ. And prevention of, the, uh, of any activity by the germ in the form of sterilization, water, and so on, is what we call asepsis. Uh, asepsis and surgical theaters or disinfection or antisepsis. And that's where we can stop infection at source if we have a means of preventing the germ getting through whatever the environmental medium is, air, water, or whatever, to the host. And that is K, or what I showed in the equation, beta, the attack rate, the attack T. But having entered the host, the microbial invader, then, accounts, then encounters a variety of challenges. 
in the form of the host zone competitive flora, a major factor. One of the most important defenses against any infection is a healthy natopharyngeal or intestinal flora, which will often eliminate infection uh, before it gets any kind of foothold. If this competitive flora operates, then there is no infection. If it does not, it does not operate, then uh, the, the infection will, will proceed. This, if it is effective, yes, no disease. If it is not effective, then the microbial invader will move on until it encounters the germicidal power of epithelial secretions and notably immunoglobulins. Immunoglobulin A in nasopharyngeal mucus and so on, immunoglobulins B in the blood, in each case instructed by, by a preoperative uh, cell-mediated immunity, uh, lymphocyte-mediated system. And then, it will, again, if this works, there will be a rejection of the pathogen and no disease. If it doesn't work, then we get colonization somewhere. And interferon and cytokines and other things may play a part at that time. And you may or may not have local cell immunity, a thing which may be promoted by vaccination. Um, and if, there's no, if there is adequate local cell immunity, again, rejection and no disease. If there is no effective barrier there, then you get invasion and disease. Still run into systemic immunity operating via the antibody system of immunoglobulins, um, which would come, of course, also sometimes with vaccination, and that will confer systemic immunity, and there still will be rejection and no disease. So there are all kinds of ways in which, naturally, people will recover from infection up to that point. But if none of these mechanisms operate, then disease will occur. And it's really here that therapy comes into play, into play. And then the communicable potential of that is, as in the other equation, the difference, the differential equation of the difference between susceptibles over a period of time, um, which gives a, a, a figure determined by the, co key, the contact rate between infectious and susceptibles. Now that's the theory of what's happening, but of course much else could occur, and uh, the much else depends very often upon how people are placed, where they are placed, to what extent they are at risk, and so on. In other words, who gets what, where, how, and when. And uh, if we look at AIDS in that light, then this is how, where, and when people got AIDS in the United States, where AIDS began in 1981, or perhaps 1979. And if we look at the figures here, this is very similar to the chart which uh, uh, Dr. Kohnlein showed yesterday. Um, it shows this regular steady increase of AIDS exclusively in risk populations of um, homosexual men, bisexual men, and their partners and drug addicts until 1987 a steady increase, almost predictable. And then it began to level out. At this point, the, and Professor Dewsberg has referred to this, at this point the classification has changed. So that certain diseases which have not hitherto been admitted as identifying diseases or criteria for AIDS were suddenly put onto the list. So an increased number of people were then classified and registered as having AIDS. And there was a, an apparent increase. The real epidemic is the dark grey. The paper epidemic is the light grey. Um, and then, of course, the non-epidemic, which is the rest of the population. In other words, all the hundreds of millions of people in the U.S. and the world. That's the rest of the population in whom there is no disease. But those in whom, for one reason or another, there was disease, whether it's HIV or whatever, you choose to believe, uh, the progress was shown by this means. And it continued until there seemed to be a kind of plateau, about 1989. Now, 1988-89 was when there came, and some of you may remember this, the famous London Declaration of AIDS. This was the first major international, truly international conference on AIDS, and it issued a declaration in which it said that this was not simply a disease of homosexual, bisexual men and drug addicts. It was, in fact, 
were killing a lot of people and it was going to spread similarly in other people and there was going to be a pandemic beginning in the United States with hundreds of thousands or millions of cases extending to Europe similarly and then um, extending globally to the rest of the world with millions of cases. And those were the predictions that were made in the 1998 Decla London Declaration of AIDS. Now, what happened was that the true epidemic in grey began to decline. It certainly did not increase, even with full registration. However, in 1992, the classification system was changed again. And this time, the paper epidemic exceeded the real epidemic by a factor of three. Now, these are the cases which form the basis of the prediction for the global pandemic. Um, and um, it looked very impressive in 1992 when in the United States particularly, they were able to collectivize a lot of other cases, diagnose other things and call them AIDS. So there was a tremendous increase after that the residue of other cases which could be diagnosed as AIDS was more limited. So the paper epidemic diminished, even the paper epidemic diminished. But uh, the real epidemic diminished more. Now, in the United Kingdom, the errors were just as great or greater because, uh, the, as mentioned, the year 1988, the year of the famous London Declaration and so on, um, the Cox Committee, appointed by the government at that time, predicted that, it by, that there would be um, 1,590 to 15,000, a range of 1,500 to 15,000, even allowing for statistical complacency. There was a wide limit of confidence. Um, but this was the prediction, and the total would be uh, something like 8,000, as, well, as, my, as high as 34,000 by 1992. And Gordon. Would increase to about this level by 1992. Now, in the following year, the Royal Society in London held a symposium with all the experts convened to make their predictions and estimates mathematical grounds. Again, the range varied widely from about 700 to about 12,000 per year. And the totals varied equally widely from about 5,000 to about 27,000 per year. Um, the actual totals were 1418 and 6929. Those are the totals of registered cases by 1992. Now, the predictions made by myself in 1990, based on the model that you've just seen, in fact, were rather closer to the mark. And the important thing, there wasn't anything that was all that clever about that, but the important thing was that it was correct and uh, that there was no yeah. epidemic. And since then, the number of cases in the United Kingdom has never increased much beyond that figure. And in some respects, it's declining. What also declined was what uh, Dr. Bishenko of the World Health Organization and I defined in 1985 as being the fast track. If we go back to uh, the figures of the USA, this was the fast track of AIDS. These were the cases which were diagnosed in 1981, 82, 83, 84. Those were men who were gravely ill, young men who were gravely ill. They had candidiasis uh, spluttering out of the mouth. They had esophagitis, they had dysenteric signs, uncontrollable diarrhea, they had pneumocystis pneumonia, and they suffered badly, lost weight, and died quickly. That was the fast track of AIDS. And the, the etiology of the fast track was that these were all homosexual men with multiple changes of partner. Many of them had had other communicable and, and sexually transmissible diseases. Many, if not all, were using nitrites as inhalants and euphorients. Many were using other drugs as well. And they were all sharing their infections in the bathhouses of the Bay Area and New York and London and Paris, Amsterdam and so on. That was the fast track. When they began to realize the risks, and the risks were drawn to their attention and credit, it was many of those men themselves who realized the risk, then the fast track 
began to run on slower rails. Um, and to know about that, you do not turn to the descriptions that come from the National Institute of Health or the CDC or the United Kingdom or the governments or WHO. You have to read books by Randy Schultz and Michael Callan and John Donaldson and others of the homosexual community who knew what was going on. They will tell you what are the behavioural and um, risk components of the fast track. Now, in the, as I said, in the United Kingdom, it was possible to make a prediction. This was the point at which I made my prediction, up to on the trains up to 1989, and these predicted accurately what was going to happen until 1994, roughly, and by that time, the new classification had taken over and prediction became impossible, because you could predict a real epidemic to some extent, you cannot predict a paper epidemic, which is engendered by bureaucrats in the, in the various health bureaucracies. To show it more precisely, this is uh, an analysis of the same figures of the last slide uh, um, analysed in terms of trains, because within what was simply shown as a linear trend in the last slide, you can clearly see that there are two trains, perhaps three. And if you do a trend analysis, then uh, the trend is finally towards a decline, and in fact, the trend analysis gives a remarkably accurate prediction of the total in the United Kingdom um, uh, by the year 1993, after which it, it can't be operated upon because of the change of classification. These, the grey columns are the registrations, and though this line with the squares and the prediction, and the fast track is this part here, where there was undoubtedly some trend of, of uh, temporary exponential increase, which has not been sustained since. Some of this, of course, is the result of the 1987 change in classification. Now, it's not just a matter of how many people um, acquired symptoms of AIDS and were registered as such. It was also a question, as I've said, of who got what, when and where. So if we take where, New York City, this was, with the Bay Area, the original epicentre of AIDS. And of course the figures there are very, very much greater than the figures I'm showing for the United Kingdom. Because by uh, 1994, the cumulative total was uh, almost 54,000 in men, and about 12,000, 12,500 in women. Now in men, the majority of course were in this high risk group of sex with men or drugs only. This accounted for uh, something like 90% of the total, um, especially if you add on those who um, took uh, drugs, more than one drug, and were in both risk categories. The figure in New York, even in New York, the figure who, of persons presumed infected or presumed registered as a result of heterosexual contacts were almost negligible by comparison. And among women, if you look at the, the risks there, then the main risk is from drug abuse or from being a partner of, uh, of uh, a man who's engaging in drug uh, abuse or a, a, a bisexual man. And the, the risk to women from bisexual men is definite, although not, uh, of course, nearly as high numerically as the risk of homosexual sex between men. Now, let me, I'm often accused of being homophobic on account kind of mentioning this, but let me say that is not so. I do not know what the proportion of homosexual men is who have um, no interest in, in sex with multiple partners. I do not know what that proportion is. But what I do know, and what anyone who is investigating this problem knows, is that the people, the men particularly at risk, are those who have multiple partners and who engage in various forms of sex, including oral sex and so on, with multiple exchange of partners. Those are the men who are especially at risk, and that risk is increased out of all proportion if they also use uh, um, recreational drugs, particularly nitrites, 
which are still very freely available. Most of the other dangerous drugs are somehow rather under restrictions. Nitrites, which are in this respect among the most dangerous drugs, are not, uh, and are freely available and are freely used because they have a euphoriant effect, they have a relaxing effect on, for example, the anal sphincter, um, and they also um, are uh, very easily obtained and can be taken uh, by anyone, anywhere, simply by crushing a uh, uh, capsule. Now that was in New York. Now what about London and England? So here we are in the United Kingdom. The total, of course, is very much less. Instead of, um, instead of running up into the 60, 70, 80 thousand, we're running about eight and a half thousand. And um, at the same time. Now, if you look at this in terms of the population, white, black, and Asiatic, then you find that uh, of course, the majority of cases were in the white population, who out of a population of 60 million are naturally in the majority. And the black population, a very much smaller denominator. Um, if we take adults only, about 10 and a half million white, about 208,000, there's more than that, black, and about uh, almost half a million Asiatic. And that shows that the number of cases occurring in the black population is very much higher, incidence per 100,000, is very much higher than in the white population. But reciprocally, the, uh, the incidence in the Asiatic population is very much lower than that in the white population and in the black population. So you can ask this question in two ways. Why is it that uh, black men, mainly Afro-Caribbean, are so much more susceptible to full-blown AIDS or you can see why is it that Asiatic people are, by comparison, so much less susceptible than the native white population. So there's nothing, there is no ethnic pre preference or criticism or anything pejorative in this. This is simply what happens. You can say that blacks are more susceptible. You can say that Asiatics are much less susceptible. And these are points which, in terms of their and physical attributes and in terms of the behavior need investigation and that's a way what I'm talking about. Now to step aside and look at the drug position for a moment. Um, as I said yesterday, long before I became involved in AIDS, I was involved in running or trying to run a program for investigation and control of drug dependence in the United States, beginning in New Orleans and also extending via various international um, efforts to New York City and elsewhere. And uh, we arrived at this uh, model of drug use, just as the model of infectious diseases is expressed in terms of mathematics and immunochemical factors. So here, we can express this in terms of what people do at any one time. People move from non-use of drugs up to intoxication through those stages, use, abuse, addiction, intoxication. Uh, very often, use begins with experimentation, curiosity, and peer group, personal attitudes, peer group pressure, and so on. And in any way, there's an activation of the pressure principle which maintains it. Hence, you, get, you move from use to abuse, more trips, and more physiological change, and then increase in drug-seeking behavior. And then, with addiction, you get habit and character change, and finally, cerebral organic change. And that is where the combination with the overload of infections of AIDS provides you with the fast track. This plus the kind of behavior which breaks down the body's defenses in AIDS gives you the fast track. And of course, our way of, as, my, as Dr. Georgina Stewart uh, showed yesterday, the way to control these and other infections and the way to control drug abuse in many ways is to have an act, act, active program for source tracing. In other words, detect the case, detect how the case became infected, detect who is at risk from the case and the contact of the case. And then uh, they follow this kind of procedure. This is what we do with tuberculosis, with other sexually transmissible and many other infections. This is what we don't do with AIDS, because we put it 
under some kind of separate category, um, and it's not politically correct to subject AIDS to this method of investigation. Now, I'm often asked uh, about this because we're talking mainly about New York, about UK, about the Western world, so people say, what happens in Africa? Now, to some extent, I have to answer that by saying I don't know because what is happening in different countries of Africa, especially Sub-Saharan Africa, it's very difficult to understand unless you really um, understand living conditions, lifestyle, and tribal habits, and so on there. I've been in Africa many times, and I still don't pretend to understand even a fraction of what's going on. So, broadly speaking, I do not know. But some things do come through to me rather strongly. This little boy, and you see plenty of little boys like that um, in Kenya, Nigeria, and other countries, mainly in sub-Saharan Africa. This little boy is at high risk of malnutrition, he has obvious malnutrition, of severe dermatitis, edema, great distress and fear. And this little boy can be counted in hundreds of thousands, possibly millions, throughout sub-Saharan Africa. He may well be orphaned. And the present diagnosis, if he turned up here today, or if he turned up in a clinic in Africa, almost certainly he would be given a test for HIV. But even if he was not given a test for HIV, he would be diagnosed as having AIDS on clinical grounds. But this picture was taken in Nigeria in, 19, in the 1960s. And that little boy had a disease known in local language throughout Central Africa, as Central West Africa, as Crasher Core, protein, calorie, malnutrition, which is just about as common now in those parts of Africa as it was then. Only then it was called Crasher Core. Now it is not called Crasher Core. Now, I won't say any more than that because there's a great deal can be read into that if you think of what might be happening with adults with diseases like cholera and tuberculosis and many others which are recurring um, on a massive scale, far outrunning the number shown in the earlier slide and which are in certain populations just as common as malnutrition and that kind of suffering in children. And that is true across a wide belt of sub-Saharan Africa. It is not true of deprived countries in North Africa. It is not true in other deprived countries of the Third World. It is peculiar to certain parts of the Third World and notably sub-Saharan Africa. But what was on as well as protein calorie malnutrition is difficult to understand. Thank you. Ringraziamo allora Gordon Stewart per la sua ricognizione intorno al eh, diciamo così alle conseguenze dell'assenza di immunità. E, Volevo chiedere a questo punto però se c'è una notazione da parte di, da parte di, per esempio, di qualcuno di voi.
non so, di David Rasnik o di... Ecco, forse David Rasnik ha qualche notazione da fare. Prego. A proposito dell'esposizione di Gordon Stewart. Avvicini il microfono. Sì. Allora, eh, un, un attimo solo. C'è un apparecchio che può essere portato qui per il maestro... Fausto Tapergi. Maestro, la cosa più importante. Beh, più importante. Maestro di vita. Di vita. Maestro di vita ed arte. Yeah. Di vita ed arte. Yeah. Eh. No, no. Non c'è cosa più nobile, no? Eh. Ah. Okay. Aspettiamo un attimo che arrivi ecco, un apparecchio. Eccolo qua. Allora prego. Ok. Um, I, was, I knew where Gordon was going with that presentation. Uh, I think it's very effective where he shows uh, historically what infectious diseases, how they behave, and then compares that to AIDS. And uh, a typical infectious disease um, exactly. doesn't look very similar to what, to what uh, we see with AIDS. But um, I really wanted to uh, uh, make a comment that um, I thought might be interesting. Uh, It's not about the AIDS part, though. It was about the preliminary infectious diseases uh, that Gordon was showing. They showed all of these various diseases that started at high, relatively high incidences, and then they were going down, like polio, measles, um, whooping cough. Uh, and it, it occurred to me that we didn't know exactly where those started. And I was thinking, I was wondering in my mind, um, what happened, you know, uh, before that. And I was thinking maybe it was the world turmoil of World War II that sort of just scrambled everything up and then was the source of many um, of the problems and many of those diseases that we saw after World War II, you know, then when the war was over, things were starting to calm down. People were getting settled again. And then m maybe that was why we had all of these uh, high levels of these infectious diseases as a consequence of World War II. And then after the war, they were just normally settling out and disappearing. Uh, because I was wondering why, you know, why polio then? Why all of these things? So, um, uh, Gordon, is, is my comment fairly clear? I guess I turn it into a question. Uh, do you, Would, would my analysis or my question uh, make sense to a professional like you? Yes, I should. Allora, prego, ve la risposta. Grazie. Yes, uh, David, I take your point, and I think there's no doubt at all that many of those diseases, especially polio, was probably. Um, aggravated by the conditions after World War II. After all, uh, polio was and is still endemic in Southeast Asia and the Far East, and many uh, Allied personnel served in uh, Southeast Asia and the Far East and came back to um, Europe, Western Europe and the USA, which were relatively free from poliomyelitis. It was an occasional disease and hardly ever an epidemic. And then this was spread. Yes, this uh, infection then was spread um, throughout the Western world. And of course, we all know about that. We all perhaps have seen pictures of or even remember uh, children in respirators and so on uh, w with, um, with wards full of such children, which was the most unusual sight. So there's no doubt that it was a consequence of, of the spread of the virus of poliomyelitis following World War II. Um, and similarly, other diseases might have recurred, but not all of them. Some of those diseases that I showed in the slide have been well monitored since the 1870s in the UK and in parts of the USA and elsewhere. And we know that the trend 
of decline had begun long before that. But these are acute infectious diseases. And as David said, um, there are other infectious diseases which I want us to look at in other ways. For example, a little cold in the head, in a way, is like a minor attack of influenza. Uh, many other infections, glandular fever, um, some of the uh, sexually transmissible diseases like chlamydia are not like that at all. They occur in a very gradual, um, way which is not at all obvious and maybe years before they become apparent. And of course, one of the arguments, and I'm not saying yes or no, one of the arguments in AIDS is that HIV can do just that. It can come in and behave as a very slow, latent pathogen over a long period of time, rather like herpes simplex, and can then recur in an unexpected way years later. That does happen with some infections. It can happen even with malaria. And uh, the, it has to be taken into account. Uh, whether this happens or not in AIDS, we don't know, because we are uncertain of the status of HIV. Whether it is a virus with true primary pathogen powers or whether it is something which is a latent or passenger virus, as Peter Duisberg says, or whether it has never been properly isolated at all and is, as some people say, a fictitious virus. There are all three possibilities which are being investigated. My own view is that the epidemiological evidence, and I can't speak authoritatively about the microbiology, but the epidemiological evidence is that HIV cannot possibly by itself account for the incidence and distribution and pathogenesis of AIDS, not by itself. It may or may not be a part. Um, on the other hand, about uh, Dr. Rastrick's point about infectiousness in AIDS, there's no doubt that AIDS, whatever the original cause, it, f it finishes up as an overload of infections, any or all of which may be transmitted. For example, candida, which is uh, an invariable accompaniment of fast-track AIDS, is freely transmissible between subjects, orally or rectally, um, and so on, with, uh, with other infections, especially uh, pneumocystis. I'm wondering on what basis predictions were made about the epidemic. I'm, I know that in the United States, ever since the virus, so-called AIDS virus, can be tested, that is since 1985, one million Americans exactly were HIV positive. That number has not gone up and has not gone down in 15 years in, uh, since it can be tested. In fact, it has gone down slightly now. They reversed it downwards. Based on European estimates, half a million were said to be positive since 1986 and 1997 has not changed. So if you make predictions on the, for AIDS, assuming that the virus is the cause of it, you would have predicted exactly the same number of AIDS cases every year, whatever your choice is how to correlate AIDS with HIV. But if predictions are otherwise, as you said, they were, I would like to know on what basis they were made. Yes, Yes, this is a very fair question too. Now, um, I agree with the figures that in the USA and the UK and Europe generally, the number of